by echoing the kind words that Ava just mentioned. And I want to thank Sarah for giving me the opportunity to be here today. And so, frankly, when she asked me if I would like to give a TED Talk, I was in disbelief. Immediately, I thought about all of the talented speakers who had spoken before me. Michelle Obama, or Stephen Hawking, or um, Bill Gates. All very established individuals who have spoken on behalf of the TEDx organization. And so, before I begin, I, I wanted to really explain to you guys here today why being here is so, so special and so humbling. Um, and I'd like to share a quick anecdote before I begin to explain why this is so important to me. And so, when I was in grade 9, I attended a leadership conference, kind of similar to this, called Leadership Links. And the keynote speaker was none other than Blake Fly. And so, Blake Fly is the speaker who is going to be here today closing up this conference. And so for me to be here today speaking before he does is all the more humbling and special. And so, as I began to process kind of the enormity of being here, I thought, what kind of speech could I give that would be able to uphold Ted's mandate to spread ideas worth sharing? And so, I began by unpacking the theme of today's conference, Memento Mori. And so, a literal um, translation of Memento Mori is remember death, or remember that we all must die. And so, upon hearing this at first, it has a rather ominous quality. Um, it reminds us about the finality of death, that we all have an expiration date. It reminds us that our life here on this earth is finite. And so, some may say that that's actually quite a depressing idea. But I'd like to think it's actually pretty inspiring, pretty energizing. We've been given this unfathomably rare opportunity to exist here on this earth, in this moment, right now. And so, why not live a fulfilling life? Why not live life with energy? Why not live life happy? But seven years ago, as a grade nine student, I sat in the conference very similar to this, listening to Blake Fly give a speech. And at that time in my life, I was not happy. When I was in grade nine, I was immediately successful. I was a student council representative. In grade 10, I was promoted to the Minister of Public Relations on my student council, elected by the student body. In grade 11, I became co-president of my student council, all the while managing being the captain of both the soccer team and the volleyball team. And so for me, I needed to be the best I needed to be at the top of my game in everything that I did. And so at the end of grade 11, I applied for the president of the student senate. In this capacity, I was elected by 16, the 16 high schools in the York Catholic District School Board to act as the liaison between over 10,000 student voices and the senior administration at the board. It was a very challenging role, but it was a very fulfilling role. And for me, um, it, being successful had become the norm. It had become my identity. And so, then grade 12 rolled around. I went to a very academically focused high school. And there was a lot of pressure to succeed. I remember my peers talking about what kind of a university program they were going to get into, or what kind of career path that they wanted in the future. And so we started applying to universities. I applied to a few Ivy League schools. I felt good. 
I felt in control. But for me, the goal was U of T engineering science. People had said it was the most challenging undergraduate program in Canada, perhaps in North America, some would argue. And so I needed to get in. And I was going to get in no matter the cost. I remember lying in my bed. It was the last day before second semester. And I was reflecting on my performance in first semester. And I had a challenging, a challenging collection of courses. I had physics, chemistry, advanced functions. And by the end of that semester, I had scored a 92% average. That wasn't good enough. That wasn't going to cut it. U of T Engineering Science had a 94% acceptance average. And I was below that. So that, made, that meant that I was going to need to make some changes in my life. And so as I lay there, lying in my bed, I told myself, I'm going to set out a plan. I'm going to make some sacrifices. I'm going to cut out some things for my life. And so I cut out breakfast and lunch. I was going to start a trial period. At the beginning, if I could cut out eating, I would have more time to work. And so I tested my little theory. The first few marks started coming in. Hundreds. Okay. All right. This is working. I'm going to keep going. It was not until about early March when the second semester grades were supposed to come out that I had realized what kind of decisions I was making. I remember my supervisor at the student senate come up to me and ask me if I'd been eating. I remember at that time, it also coincided perfectly when the second semester grades were supposed to be reported to the universities. And at that point, I was at my lowest weight of 130 pounds. <clears throat> but at that time, I had scored a 97.3% average. And so for me, that was good enough. I was in control of my destiny, and it didn't matter what kind of cost it had on my body. And so, <clears throat> a little later, a nice little envelope came in the mail, U of T Engineering Science, accepted. I put back on the weight, and things were okay. I forgot about the decisions I had made, and I kind of put that in the back of my mind. I was going to U of T Engineering Science in the fall, things were good, forget about the rest. And so, that fall, I started U of T Engineering Science, full of energy, full of excitement. And things started pretty well. The marks started coming in. Decent. Some A's, some B's. It was university, so that was okay. A little bit harder. And then, I remember Calculus 1. I was sitting in my residence room, small little room in the basement of St. Michael's College, and I pulled up my laptop, and I looked at my calculus grade, and it was a 37%.
that's when I had my first mental breakdown. <coughs> I was a complete mess. I picked up the phone. I called my parents. I said, put a rush on it. You need to come down here. I don't know what's going on. What's happening? This isn't normal. This isn't me. But that was just the beginning. It just kept getting worse. Grades dropped. Wasn't eating properly. Didn't sleep. So a lot of pressure to succeed. At that moment in my life, I had lost control and it terrified me. I was no longer infallible. I was no longer perfect. That identity that I had created for myself, fabricated, was so important to me that I hadn't just failed that test, I had failed myself. But why? Why was being successful so important to me? Why had being successful become my identity? Because it was my shield. Because it was my coping mechanism. Because being successful was the one thing that could distract from my weakness, my little secret that I didn't want anyone to know about. But ironically enough, it was that secret that provided me the fuel to gain control of my life once again. To gain control of my life in a constructive way and in a positive way. And so on August 31st, 2015, I sent the following email to my parents. Hey mom and dad, I am sending you this email to let you know about some exciting news. I am gay. I am not sure if you have both already had your suspicions, but I hope this does not change our relationship. <laughs> I guess perhaps not having a girlfriend may have been a clue. For some time, I tried to hide this, but I am now completely comfortable with my sexuality. I decided to send you an email to give you both the opportunity to have some time to process this. <laughs> Since I'm heading back to school, I thought it would be a nice way to start off the new school year so I don't have to hide this from you any longer. I wanted to send you an email instead of telling you in person, not because I don't think you would take it positively, but so that you could both have some time to think before we speak. Love you both. Alex. Very, very businesslike. <laughs> identity because it was easier to have people focus on my success than ask those pressing questions. Hey, how come you don't have a girlfriend? Bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was busy studying. I, I had athletics. I had extracurricular events. I had to do all these things. And so, for me, that's why it became so much a part of me. But my story is not unique. According to a prominent LGBTQ writer, Mark Joseph Stern, gay men tend to score higher GPAs in college and in high school than their straight counterparts. They tend to have higher paying jobs and involve themselves in many more extracurricular endeavors. He goes further to say that gay men are acutely aware of the challenges that they'll face, and so they feel like they need to do more. As I started to become more comfortable with my identity and I met more gay men, men in the, my university community, I realized that I wasn't alone. 
Some of my best friends are studying at Harvard or Yale or studying rigorous programs like pure mathematics at U of T or medicine. And at first you'd think, well, maybe it wasn't so bad. This pressure had allowed them to be successful. But at what cost? Depression? Anxiety? Self-loathing? What for? And so, I titled this speech, The Best Little Boy in the World, after a narrative by Andrew Tobias. Same title. And the narrative is about the pressure to overcompensate, trying to focus yourself in so many different areas that people will be distracted from your true self. And that's not healthy. And so, he told that story first, but I'm here today to retell it. Because I think about that speech I attended when I was in grade 9, that was given by none other than Blake Fly. And I thought about how I was depressed in that moment and sad. And I thought, sometimes things come full circle. Why not come here today and give the speech that I would have liked to have heard? Be happy. Be healthy. Be successful. But be gay too. <laughs> And so, today, the theme of today's speech is memento mori, remember death. But I say, memento mori, feliciter che vive. Remember death, but please live life happily. Thank you.